I mean, as you mentioned, you're you have, I uh, you have a little bit of an engineering background, right? Where you've 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 done a bit, or at least you understand. You've heard of things. Uh, for you. the purposes of the conversation, let's say yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Educative Sessions. My name is Lingo, and I am the community manager manager here with Educative. Educative makes it easy for authors to provide interactive and adaptive courses for software developers. And Educative Sessions is a multi-episodic campaign to engage people in the developer world about their coding experiences. My guest today is Scott McAllister, who is a developer av advocate with PagerDuty. And today's topic is leaving our quote, home site behind the beginnings of my career in community development. Uh, Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks, Lee. It's great to be here. Scott, let's begin. Uh, let's start with the beginning of the story, which is you were and a colleague were working for Utah State, right? Um, just about 90 minutes outside of Salt Lake City. And uh, tell us what you were doing, um, what you and your colleague were doing at the time. So at the time, I was a student, I was finishing up my, my time there at Utah State University, and I was working for a research group at the university called Early Intervention Research Institute, which did research on you know early uh, early life development right for kids and children and things like that and the application we were working on uh, was a an application called the universal application system and what it did is it provided a way for people to uh, uh looking for you know government help like with you know medicaid and WIC and chip and all those different organizations all those different places you have to go and fill out paperwork at all the different ones to apply and get those different services. This application actually made it possible to fill out one set of, of you know, questions, and then it submitted it your, your application to all the different services. And so it was kind of fun and exciting because it was my first sort of real you know, programming job as a student. Um, and in my, it started my professional career as a developer, but it also was a project that helped people right you, you you saw the impact that it made on people that it made people's lives easier to help them get the services that they needed to to help raise their kids and if, if they needed help from the the various agencies and uh while we were doing there we were we were using a tech stack uh where cold fusion was the language on the back end and with the postgres database and uh it, for me i was just so excited to have a job right i mean uh, in, in college when you're in school your, your goal is to, to find some sort of employment. And it was great that I was able to, to find this, this opportunity on campus so that I could still be there and then um, also develop off of the skills I learned in college. Although we didn't learn about cold fusion in college. Yes. Uh, this was something I learned on the job. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about cold fusion and forgive me, I'm actually not super familiar with cold fusion. A lot of the code that I've picked up is from different uh, languages. So is cold fusion, is it, what, what is it, what is it based on? Is there a language that's like closely proximate to it? And, and why were you so compelled to uh, work with it? Compelled to work with it was there was a job opportunity and I, right. I mean, isn't that what lit, that motivates us sometimes? I mean, sure. we just want a, a job and uh, uh, what I like about it, what I liked about it, especially at the time was that I had HTML, CSS, a little bit of JavaScript experience, although JavaScript wasn't what it is today back then. And this will date me a bit because Cold Fusion, you know, is, is a little bit, I would say, a language of the past. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a language that was tag-based, a lot like HTML. And um, it allowed you, it, its main focus when it first came out was to, uh, to easily connect your web applications with databases. It was one of the first ones to really make it easy to do that. You could just kind of have a tag that did it and you have a CF query tag and then you put your query inside this tag and boom, you have a connection, you know, you're interfacing with the database and you have that information in your applications. And so with that, uh, there was, I mean, as you mentioned, you're, you have, I, uh, you have a little bit of an engineering background, right? Where you've, you've, you've done a bit, or at least you understand, you've heard of uh, things. Let's, for the purposes of conversation, let's say yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. En enough to know you you know of the trends. Mm -hmm. You know of of the languages and the tech stacks that people are using. Right. And Cold Fusion doesn't come up a lot. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Especially today. Back then, it came up a little bit more often. But 
the the idea was is we were this two person development team on this small research group at the university, and to be honest, I mean you there was there was definitely obviously the internet and everything, and we could get information from different websites and from Macromedia who owned the Cold Fusion product at the time. I could totally go off on a tangent talking about the intricacies of Cold Fusion, but mm -hmm. Just for the sake of this conversation, Cold Fusion as a product is a server product that Macromedia owned at the time. Now Adobe does. The language is actually CFML, Cold Fusion Markup Language. Mm -hmm. I wanted to throw that out there because if anybody watching and listening to this was had familiarity with Cold Fusion, they would totally call me out on that. So I understand there's a difference between the server and the language. But anyway, side note. Uh, but there was we were just a small group of two people and. I, he was a really smart developer, the, the lead engineer on the, on the project, and I learned a lot from him, and you know he pointed me to great resources. But uh, at the time, I was also heavily involved uh, while I was a student at Utah State University with online communities for soccer, because I was huge, and I'm still huge into soccer. Really? And What's your team? I, oh, geez, what league? <laughs> <laughs> um, start, start it somewhere. Uh, yeah, we'll start, how about start MLS and um, and like maybe one international team? Okay, so MLS. I, I've been a nomad because I've moved around a lot. Um, as MLS has started, I was a, I was a kid in Kansas City when in '96 when that when that came out. So okay. I, I like the Wiz, but uh, RSL was a big team. It is, it's actually part of this story. So Real Salt Lake. Yeah. Um, the the group the team that was there in Salt Lake City before uh, MLS. Uh, was a third division team uh, known as the Utah Blitz, but they had a community, an online community that connected not only online, but we also got together at games and we got together. Actually, no, at that time, it was pretty much just games because with division three teams, you're not watching them on TV because it's D3. Um, and so, but I, I loved that feeling of camaraderie, of feeling like you weren't the only one doing something, but also learning. I learned a ton. Uh, there were people in that group that there was a, a an English guy in that group that would, you know, he'd share kind of what he knew about English soccer. And that's where I kind of learned a little bit about English soccer, which takes me into my English league team. Um, at the time, this is early 2000s, there was an American player playing for a team in Manchester called Manchester City. And I always have to distinguish that I like Manchester City before they got money. Um, but now they're an incredible, you know, huge, huge team. So I'm, I'm a Manchester City fan. Got but it. I learned about them through that community. Got it. Got it. So let's yeah. talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, this work that you were doing in Cold Fusion and um, your interest in connecting with a Cold Fusion community. Right. So uh, yeah. the very journey that got you to this uh, this group. Let's go from there. So I, I discovered that there was a there's these things called user groups at the time. That's what we call them. And uh, there was a Salt Lake Cold Fusion user group. And I thought that'd be really cool to go down to one of these meetings and like meet these people. And the lead engineer at the time that I was working this, working with, his name was Chris Schofield. So Chris, if you're watching, thank you. Uh, he was super supportive. He, he heard this idea. I was like, you know, there's this group down in Salt Lake and Salt Lake, as you mentioned, 90 miles away. So it's not a short trip. And uh, I was like, we should, I think we should go down and go see what they do, what they, what they're talking about. Uh, I think at the time, the first meeting, I don't remember what the topic was, but we were like, hey, we should go listen about this topic that they're talking about. And so we wanted to get involved and go down and see, you know, to the big city, right? Um, and, and see what uh, what we uh, would experience there. And Wonderful. so, yeah. So, uh, you know, you find this user group, um, you're really excited, you and your colleague, you've just gotten through an hour and a half drive. Uh, and uh, what happened then? What was sort of like that, awakening moment was it a great experience at first at first so yeah honestly walking in everybody was super welcoming supportive uh just happy to see you know new people in the group uh if i remember correctly we had oh a dozen or so people there maybe two dozen i mean it was a it wasn't a, a tiny tiny group but it wasn't super huge and we sit down and we're getting you know everybody settles down after you know mingling and getting pizza or whatever and we're, we're, I remember we're sitting at least in the second row because there was a row of people in front of us. And the speaker gets up and is about to get into his talk. And he says, so just taking a quick uh, scan of the audience, who here is still using HomeSite? And me and my coworker go, Whoosh. 
we look around, and the guy in front of us turns around and goes, whoa. We're the only people in the whole room holding up our hands. The only ones. And uh, we sat there looking at each other like, uh-oh. We're obviously not in the know. And in that meeting, we learned that everybody's using Eclipse, and everybody was using this Eclipse plugin called CF Eclipse. But we wouldn't have known that had we not gone and mingled with the people, right? Talked with the other developers who were doing Cold Fusion at the time. And so it's those things that I love about community. I love the talks. I love that people come and share talks and prepared messages, but it's, it's that interaction with everyone that you learn just like how people are doing things, what has worked, what doesn't work. It's just, it was really a good, honestly, it was embarrassing in the moment. And obviously it's many years later and I still have never forgotten it, but it was super productive and helpful for me. Gotcha. I mean, I, how did, um, you know, from that moment though, was it just a quick moment? I mean, did, where people were giving you a hard time about it or what was your experience with that community after that? And then um, did you still stay in touch with that community? Absolutely. We became regulars. We went down every month. Uh, we drove and, and our bosses actually, when they heard about what we were doing, they were super supportive of the fact that like, Hey, yeah, you're, you're cutting out a little early on a, you know, one day a month, but it's to go down and actually you know, learn stuff about how to become better engineers and what you're building with and, you know, understanding your tools better. And so they were very, very supportive and the people were great. It was, it's like, you have this community of people that you all have something in common. And that thing that you have in common, at least for like user groups in this case, was a particular tech stack that we were all building with. And so we could all commiserate on the good things, but also on the things that were weird about it, because every language has weird things, mm -hmm. you know? And so it was great to, to do that. And the whole time while, I shouldn't say the whole time, but for a long time, we would go down and we would go down every month. And uh, it wasn't until I discovered that we weren't the only group at Utah State University, just even just the university we were at in Logan, Utah, um, that actually used Cold Fusion. I was poking around on the on the university website and realized the university website had Cold Fusion going on in it. So there had to be other Cold Fusion engineers somewhere in town. And so that's when I, I started getting these ideas of like, wait, I drive 90 miles every month to go visit with this group to get this sense of community. What if we like started one like here in Logan or in Cache Valley, which is what uh, the area is called. And uh, doing some research there, found out that not only was, you know, our group doing it and there was a group on campus using Cold Fusion, there was also a company in town that was using Cold Fusion. And suddenly there's this mixture of a lot of different people coming together, understanding of like, wait, it's not just PHP that's going on. Back at the time, it was basically just, you know, everybody would talk about PHP uh, and, or, or Python or Ruby at the time. And, uh, and so those were kind of the languages that all the different groups uh, at the university would do uh, when they're building web applications. And so we were able to build up this understanding with one another, but also share stories and share experiences, share projects we've been working on. Uh, and it was super, super helpful, I think, for all of us in our careers. Well, that's awesome. I mean, I, I can only imagine what that would have been like for you uh, to discover a community that was just kind of crawling out of the cave and being like, I just want to be seen. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, I know, uh, you know, probably that was the catalyst moment for you to discover that you could dive in, not in just the coding side of things, but in the community building side of things. Uh, Scott, so, you know, you're now a developer advocate and uh, you can, you know, I would love loosely to define what that means for you because everybody has a different definition. Sure. And also uh, for other people who want to get into community building or more specifically uh, developer advocacy, like what are some of the wisdoms or tokens of wisdoms that you'd like to share with them? Sure. Uh, yeah, the story by, of becoming a developer advocate, that's a long story. I'll try to condense it a little right. bit. But essentially at the time when I started, I started the group in, in Logan, right? The Northern Utah Cold Vision user group. I didn't know anything about developer relations or developer advocacy at the time, but all I knew is I loved building up a group and bringing people together so that we could share knowledge. It wasn't until years later that I was working at uh, my previous company. I was, I was working at Smartsheet and heard, we hired this director of developer relations and he sat right across the desk, you know, the cubicle wall from me. And I was like, Ted, what do you do? And he told me about what he did. And I said, and I thought, 
that's exactly what I want to do. He goes and he, he, the developer, he talked about developer advocates, developer relations. He does a little bit of coding, but he goes and talks to other developers. He shares what he knows and then learns what they know. And then, you know, you do the whole community thing. And that's when I realized that was, I could actually do community, build community, share knowledge, build up, you know, a, an understanding with people and get paid for it. And so as a developer advocate, I feel that's what you do. As a developer advocate, I see developer advocates as teachers. I see us as people who share knowledge with people outside of our company, uh, where we take the knowledge of our APIs and our platforms and we share it with developers outside the company. But then also we gather that information, we, we hear the feedback of those developers and then take it internally to our company, to our product teams, to our engineering teams. And so as a developer advocate, I feel like I'm kind of that, that mediator, that, that person in between that uh, shares knowledge outward, but also brings knowledge inward. Um, and then by doing that, I think it helps build a community, not only of developers outside of your product, but it helps them feel connected to the engineers inside of your, of your company. Because, and then vice versa, because now you have this conversation that's going on of, oh, we should design our APIs like this because it helps this product it helps our product work better with infrastructure as code tools like terraform or something like that because that's what our engineers are doing this is what our engineers are doing and so sharing those stories back and forth is is, is the vital role of a developer advocate so that I probably wasn't a short explanation of, of my role as a developer advocate but uh and, what was you know. your second question i forgot <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean um it might not have been short but it was definitely comprehensive and i think that's what's required of a role that requires a little bit of that complexity. Like it's trying to address a complex issue. Um, and second, I think a lot of what you just talked about answered my second question to an extent, which was uh, what are some things that if people want to jump into your field or want to do the kind of cool things you're doing uh, for your developer community, uh, what are like one or two things that you'd recommend for them to get started or to keep in mind? For sure. The, the thing that I think makes a good developer advocate is someone who can Think about how, how do I put this? Think about how something, how to teach something to someone who doesn't know anything about what you know. Understanding that the people outside of you may not have the same understanding you do. And so by just taking a step to teach somebody something, and it could be something small, um, you know, just like a little thing about your code or a little thing about, um, I don't know, writing a, a blog post or something. If you do something cool, uh, this is a, a great idea. If you do something interesting that you found that you discovered in a project you're working on either at work or on the side, write a blog post about it. Stick it up on Dev2 or something. Or even, you know, get to a point where you're submitting stuff to Educative, right? Where you're, you're building a, a little course or something. But I think by communicating uh, with others about what you know, uh, that helps you become uh, a, a better developer advocate. So writing... Uh, blogs and honestly blog posts can be super tiny super small you write about one cool thing and share that bit of knowledge uh, and then find your local meetup groups it's a little hard right now uh, a lot of the meetup groups are not uh, really active because of us not able to get together physically but when they do find your local meetup groups they're dying for people to speak at them I run the Bellevue uh, JavaScript user group and um, we would love, love, love people to come speak. It doesn't even have to be directly related to the topic, right? If it's something to do with something that JavaScript developers see, uh, but not necessarily JavaScript specifically, uh, the, the people who run those groups would love to have you there. And those groups are always supportive. They're, I rarely have I been to a user group where the audience just doesn't agree with the speaker and they start yelling at them. You always think that they will. Like, I'll, be, I'll admit, I've done lots of talks in my life. There's always this voice in the back of my head that's like, I'm gonna walk up there and there's gonna be somebody in the audience and they're just gonna poke holes in my what I'm telling them and they're gonna find out that I'm a fraud and this is gonna be terrible. And it's never happened. So honestly, go speak, just share something. Everybody has something to share. Not everybody's an expert in everything and everybody at any level has something to share. Amen to that, amen to that. 
Uh, Scott, we are actually just running over a little bit, but you've dumped such wonderful wisdom and knowledge that uh, we'll allow it for now. Uh, or we'll allow it. We'll just say it that way. Uh, and so as a thank you, we like to offer all of our guests like an opportunity for a shameless plug. You can talk about anything you like. Uh, really, the floor is yours. Go for it. Oh, geez. Well, uh, as I mentioned, Bellevue, Bellevue JS is, a, is my user group, but get involved with your local user groups. And I'd be remiss to not at least plug PagerDuty a little bit. PagerDuty is the, the company I work for that they, they pay my bills. And so uh, it's an incident management platform that allows you to get the correct signals to the right people. So if, if something is going wrong, uh, you get the you, you, you notify the right people and get them involved so that they can resolve the incident quickly. And so that's what that PagerDuty does. We have a, a great community of developers that build applications that connect to our product. We have over 300 integrations and um, we'd love to, to have, if you can think of a, a reason why you would need to have alerting that gets to the right people, but not only to the right people, but then escalates if it doesn't get resolved um, and allows them to manage that, then uh, PagerDuty is your platform. So go check us out at developer.pagerduty.com. Fantastic. Scott, thank you so much for uh, making this happen. And I'm so glad you shared your story with us. And I know it's going to inspire. And, you know, I, I just, from one community builder to another, it's just, I, I love just the wisdom gained from these kinds of conversations. And I want to thank everybody for being a part of this conversation as well. Uh, check out our schedule or check out our social media because we have many more talks coming up uh, before 2020 ends. And also, if you want to learn more about us, check us out at educative.io. So for all of us here at Educative, thank you so much and happy learning. Bye-bye now. Thank you for watching this episode of Educative Session. If you liked this episode, please like it and share with your community. To stay informed about the latest sessions, subscribe to our channel by clicking the button above. Check out our podcast at educativesessions.podbean.com in the description below. Lastly, if you're tech curious, check us out at educative.io. Happy learning, everyone.